I want to know or start out just by asking you, you guys are not like a lot of us in the South. We have a lot of CP systems still in operation. I don't know that there's really a whole lot in California, um, but obviously there is still some, right? Still has some CP systems. Have any of you ever actually tested CP systems yourself? We have one hand in the back. That's it? My gosh, you have, well, I know you have, Wayne. We have a lot to learn. And I have no possibility of teaching you what you need to know here in about an hour and a half, right? That is not going to happen. So I'm here today to try my best to convey to you a couple of things that you can look at in your work uh, just by looking at someone else's testing records, right? You go do an inspection, you see the CP test that someone has, it says pass on it, right? When you see that magic word that says pass, you check it off on the checklist and you're done, right? Of course you are. Well, in the world of cathodic protection, you must realize that just because someone says it's a pass, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. That is the reality of cathodic protection, testing, monitoring, if you do not understand something about it, if you do not scrutinize it, no one else is, right? So it's up to you. You have to educate yourself. I recognized this uh, many years ago when I was working with the Mississippi DEQ, that we had a lot of people who had certifications that were going around doing testing, and they really had very little idea of what they were doing routinely calling things passes when they were nowhere even close. Turning in test results that just were completely nonsensical. So uh, I guess my point is, I am very happy to be here today to try to convey a little bit of knowledge to you, but if you're really serious about it, this is an area where you can make a significant difference. We have made a world of difference in the South and in Mississippi, and you can do this yourself. The testing is not hard to do. You don't need real sophisticated equipment. You just need a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of desire, and a little bit of cooperation, and you can do this testing yourself. And if people who are contractors doing this testing, if they know that you are coming back behind them, what are they much more likely to do when they do the test? They are going to learn how to do it right, and they are actually going to do it right. So this is an area, and I'll get off my soapbox now, that you can make a difference in. And I encourage you to do CP testing yourself. Learn how to do it. Um, I teach classes, two, three-day classes. that are about the minimum you can go through and have a concept of what's going on. So I'm not going to be able to teach you how to do it today. We're just going to look at some things that you can recognize very easily. And you probably don't see much of this kind of stuff going on here in California, but this is still fairly common stuff in other parts of the country. Stainless steel flex connectors are a very common issue. Um, late 1980s, early 90s, people just direct buried these things. They were stainless steel. So therefore, everyone said, well, they're stainless. They don't need any CP on them. Absolutely not correct. When you bury stainless steel, it behaves very much like carbon steel. It is not uh, acceptable at all to bury it without cathodic protection. So what you see is a lot of stuff like this going on. Uh, here is a, a place where they have direct buried stainless steel flex connectors. And what they do in an attempt to protect them is you see these little drive-in anodes. That's, that's what those are. We call those little drive-in anodes. They're a pound and a half each. They actually are the same kind of anodes that protect your water heater. That's where they come from, from the water heater industry. So they took them, they uh, adapted them to this kind of application. And when you do this, are you really protecting the flex connector? You know, it's very questionable, but when you stick a reference cell in the ground, connect a voltmeter up to it, you can get a passing reading on these things. Why? It's not hard to figure out. If you put that reference cell in close proximity to the inactive anode, you get this great looking reading. You get some fantastic number, 
but it doesn't tell you anything about whether the flex connector is actually protected or not. It's a very specific test you must do, very specific technique you must follow, and I apologize, again, we can't go into all of that. Just recognize that if someone has a scenario like this, and they say, well, I stuck the reference cell in the dirt under the dispenser and tested it, that doesn't mean anything, okay? You know, we have a lot of, quote, isolation boots, right? All kinds of crazy things going on with isolation boots. We've seen it all, been there, done that. We have all kinds of boots out there. We have one that's been marketed quite widely uh, in this scenario. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this or not, but this is a scenario where you actually have what amounts to a piece of Velcro and some Loctite trying to claim that this thing will isolate a flex connector from the soil. And it's just, you know, I'm sorry. I'm, call me a skeptic. I just don't really think this kind of product can effectively isolate a piece of metal in the ground. And so here we have all kinds of people think things people do to try to isolate things. You know, all kinds of dielectric tapes used in the pipeline industry commonly. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of tape you put on it. You are not going to be able to effectively isolate it you must have CP on a, on a metallic object like this. You know, and here's a guy who used some metallic tape inside a containment sump, probably because the containment sump is not liquid tight to begin with. But what he actually did, you may recognize this, this is a standard uh, APT, uh, coaxial flex pipe, right? And what he did is he took the tape, and what do you do with this tape? He actually wrapped up the interstitial communication of this coaxial pipe, right? Just crazy stuff. Now, this is not from Mississippi, by the way. This one is from Mississippi. Here's one where, you know, we have this scenario that's probably completely foreign to you again, but all of these are pre-Energy Act installations, right? They are not required to be double wall. So uh, you have containment sumps, but they're not watertight, and no one can try to make them watertight. They're just considered to be single-walled systems, right? They're single-walled systems. That's all they are. And so when you get this scenario and you get metal underwater, we've always said if it's underwater, it must be protected. So they take these anodes, and, of course, that's what that is. That's a uh, bag anode. That's a nine-pound anode. And connect it up to the metal in the, in the sump to protect it. So in this scenario, someone came along and disconnected the clamp you're out doing a compliance inspection, it's just very simple for you to pick up on things like this. The clamp is not even connected to the pipe. Now, having said that, even if this thing was connected to the pipe, remember what I told you about the drive-in anodes on the flex connectors in the dirt. If you put a reference cell in this containment sump and you put it in the water, because that's the only way you can measure it, Doing that with the anode connected and measuring something tells you absolutely nothing about whether the metal in that sump is protected or not. It tells you there's an anode connected, but it doesn't tell you anything about whether it actually passes or fails. Now, we have this scenario going on, and you know, this is a crazy looking picture, right? Something of interest, um, you know, what happens in this scenario is when you, when you have these bag anodes, that's the bag anode right there. It's actually backfilled from the factory with what? It's a very low resistance, what they will sometimes term a carbonaceous backfill. But what it really is is just gypsum. It's gypsum and some other things mixed in. And as we know, what do we know about gypsum? It's very, very soluble. You get water in these sumps, that gypsum goes into solution it gets oversaturated, the water evaporates out, and you get these very nice deposits on everything. It completely coats everything with gypsum. So if you ever see anything like this, that's exactly what's going on. What is wrong with this picture? 17-pound anode from the factory in the box. It's connected up to the, the pump head. Are you going to get any kind of reading on that? Of course not. Why not? Because the anode is not in contact with the electrolyte. They didn't even bother to try to bury the anode. Now, this picture is from Jersey, okay? 
Not Mississippi. I know what you're thinking, okay? Again, uh, this one is from Mississippi. Not, not much better, but this guy had a brilliant idea. He did not like that gypsum screwing up his nice pristine sump, right? It's a pristine sump for us, okay? But So what he did, he puts it inside his bucket, and of course there is, there's, what's that right there? That's his interstitial monitoring, right? It's an electronic float switch on his sensor. Of course, the wire's not connected to anything, but it looks good, right? But when he put this in his bucket, he defeated the entire purpose of the anode, right? Why? Again, because I am not in contact with the electrolyte. And so you can uh, easily demonstrate this if you don't believe me. Here's the voltmeter. Here is the reference cell right, right there on an extension. The reference cell is inside the bucket. There is a little bit of water in the bottom of that bucket. So when you hook your voltmeter up, you get this really, really nice number. As you can see, 1,681 millivolts. You know, the magic number is what? 850? That's the standard, 850. So I'm over twice. I'm virtually twice what the standard is right here. But when you take that reference cell and you put it inside the sump, outside of the bucket, the picture is entirely different. You can see that the bucket has effectively completely isolated the, the anode from any possibility of protecting the metal inside that sump. 643, that is nothing but steel. That is plain old steel, right? So some of you may have had these. We had a number of these kind of flex connectors put in in the late 1990s. They were marketed as soil safe because what they did is they made the braid material non-metallic. That's all non-metallic. And the, of course, the end fittings are carbon steel. And what their idea was was to build an anode into the end of the flex connector. And that's what that is. That's a little donut anode built into the end of the flex connector so that when you buried these things, you didn't have to worry about connecting up anodes or anything. Presto, bingo, they're protected. So when you come out to do the test, if someone had to come out and do the three-year test on such a flex connector, how would you do that on this type of system? Um, because you have two ends on this flex connector, right? Two separate pieces of metal two separate anodes, they are not electrically continuous with one another, what's the problem? You know, it's not hard to test that end of the flex connector, but how in the world are you going to test the one that is actually buried, the one that you're actually worried about? You can't make contact with it. A lot of these dug up and done away with for that simple reason. So when you do get testing in, you know, you, you see all kinds of crazy stuff, right? I don't know about you guys, but I got tired of looking at all the crazy stuff a long time ago. And I said, okay, I am going to declare that you must use this form and you must do it this way. And everybody goes, well, what about NACE? Doesn't NACE already do that? Well, no, not really, they don't. The NACE standard, if you're familiar with it, pretty well says that if you meet certain qualifications, you can do most anything you want to as long as it's within these bounds. And the bounds are like this. You can do all kinds of stuff and still meet the NACE standard within certain reason, right? So instead of all of that, I said, okay, I'm not going to accept people who claim to be NACE certified and give me test results like this. Give me, they put a number on a piece of paper and say pass, that is not going to get it. So then I have other people who cannot get, even get the name of the association right. There is no such thing as the National Association of Cathodic Protection. These guys are NACE certified. I actually know these guys. Um, the test is from Mississippi, but this is a Louisiana company, okay? Cajuns. Hey. You looked familiar. But uh, 
So here he is. He's NACE certified. He can't get the name right, but what does he do? He comes out, does his test. There's his numbers. 0.682 millivolts. The magic number is 850 millivolts or 0.85 volts, right? He can't get his units right. He can't get his decimal point in the right spot. And he's got these numbers that don't even meet the 850, however you write it down, right? But what does he do? It passes. Okay. <laughs> so you go out. You're the inspector. He's got his test. It says pass. What are you going to do with it? Is that cool? I don't think so. Look what he did with his reference cell. He put it on the concrete. Anybody who knows anything at all about testing CP knows that that is the number one rule that you must not violate. You cannot put the reference cell on the concrete. That is an absolute no-no. If you see somebody with a reference cell in their hand and they're sticking it on the concrete or the asphalt or the pavement of any kind, it is completely invalid. Do not accept it. Walk away. They're not accomplishing anything. If, if you want documentation on why that's uncool, the Air Force actually did a study. Uh, you know, the Air Force has these very long uh, flight lines that have their pipelines run along these flight lines. And they were interested in testing it without having to drill holes in their, their nice paved runways. And so what they did is they commissioned a study and they proved without any doubt that if you put a reference cell on concrete, you will change the number that you get by as much as 300 millivolts in the negative direction. So if you were to take that, and that's not always true, it depends on the characteristics of the concrete, but the safe assumption is you just moved it 300 millivolts by doing that. So, uh, you just cannot, you simply cannot do that. You cannot put a reference cell on the concrete. It has to be in the soil or the backfill that the tank is buried in. Golden rule of CP testing. Here's another company from Louisiana. They went out and they're NACE certified. They went out to uh, uh, an airport and they did some testing. He's got this thing that's highlighted here to achieve a minimum of minus 0.18 DC volts. That was the criteria he used for pass or fail. I have never in my 25 years ever seen anything like that. I have no idea where that came from. So that was the criteria he was going by. There were five tanks here. Here's his test record. What's very bizarre about this is he has these numbers that are 0.58 volts 0.64, 0 0.56. Well, those are the tanks that he said passed. Then he has these really crazy numbers of 2.13 and 6.75, and those are the ones he said failed. We have yet to figure out any clue what this guy thought he was doing. I have no idea. Then you get into all kinds of different scenarios. Did he just forget to write the number down, or did he just not want to write it down? Um, did he forget that the criteria is 850 to get a pass? I have a typical scenario with MPDs, right? I've got three product lines cause, uh, under a 3 plus 1, or I've got at least two product lines coming into my, each MPD, right? Well, I've only got one reading for all of the flex connectors under each MPD. That is completely invalid. You must measure each flex connector individually. So it can be done right. So you get things that look like this. I have uh, tanks here and I have three readings for the tank. My reference cell is put at three different locations over the tank. That is rule number two. Rule number two for testing CP is 
where you put the reference cell is the only thing that matters. Where is the reference cell in relationship to the tank, the pipe, or whatever it is? It does not really matter where you make contact with the tank. As long as you are making contact with the tank, it doesn't matter where that is. What matters is where is that reference cell in relation to the tank. So when you say you test the tank at three different test points, what you're meaning is you've picked the reference cell up and you've measured one end of the tank, you've picked it up and you measured that end of the tank, and you picked it up again and you measured the center of the tank. Moving the reference cell determines your test points, not where you make contact with the structure. People get confused about that to this day. It's not intuitive to some people. Rule number two, where is the reference cell? So if, you're, if you have an idea that you want to call somebody to do this right and you want to create your own form, the lesson is the thing that you must emphasize is where is the reference cell? And that, if you'll notice, that is the, the widest column on the form, right? That is what matters. Where's the reference cell? So in this case, he did three test points for each tank. And I'll just throw this out there. There's this concept called remote earth testing. We're all familiar with the concept of sticking the reference cell directly over the tank and measuring it, right? That is traditionally the way it's always been done. Several years ago, the Steel Tank Institute approached me to consider remote earth testing. And I said, what? But I always try to keep an open mind. So what we decided to do, we, I was in the process of developing a testing protocol. And that's why STI approached me. And so what I decided to do was say, okay, fine, we will look at it. We will do our own testing. And we will decide for ourselves. So we went out and we tested about 300 tanks local and remote. And what we saw was what they were saying was exactly right. So we decided to require both in Mississippi. You must do local testing and you must do remote. And again, I'm not able to go into exactly what remote means, but to, to simplify it, all it really means is you take your reference cell and you step off 30 to 100 feet away from the tanks and you put it in the ground, and you connect the other end of your voltmeter up to the tank, and you read what the potential of the tank is. The idea is pretty simple. You're looking at the entire tank way out there with the reference cell. You're looking at the average potential over the entire tank, and that tells you a lot about what's going on with the tank. What is the part of the tank that is going to corrode and fail before any other part of it does. Where is it going to get a hole in it? The bottom, right? Almost always it's going to be at or near the bottom of the tank. When you stick a reference cell on top of the ground directly over the tank, it's just like shining a flashlight beam on top of that tank. What you're looking at is the potential of that tank within that flashlight beam. So what you're actually measuring is the potential of the top of the tank, right? That's fairly obvious, and that is all that you are measuring. You're not looking at the bottom of the tank at all. The only way to get an idea about what's going on at the bottom of the tank is to be out there at the remote earth location with the reference cell. It's just like backing off 30 feet away with a spotlight and shining it on the tank. You're going to have the entire tank within that spotlight. So we said, well, that's cool, but you know what? We still want both. We want the local and the remote. So if you're really contemplating it, in this STI's testing policy also for P3 tanks is you must have local and remote measurements. So if you look at this, you get into a scenario where you can have one reading that passes and one that does not. And you get this term called inconclusive. And that's what you see on that first example line there. The local voltage is 928. 
That passes, right? But the remote is 810. That's not cool, right? So what do you do with that? It's inconclusive. Both of those readings must be 850 or more negative in order to pass. So, you know, you got to be very careful about how you document things. And you can look at this one and go, you know, this guy had three tanks, three P3 tanks. He had uh, three flats connectors, that is STPs, right? No sumps here. Everything's direct buried. And he has MPDs that are also direct buried. And so he has actually, these are not blenders. These are old style single product MPDs. So he's got three flats connectors under each dispenser. And he's very clearly identified each one. If you look at it, he's got regular flex at dispenser 1-2, plus flex at dispenser 1-2, premium flex at dispenser 1-2. Tested all of them. And he documented he tested all of them, both local and remote. It's very important. So the fun really gets into impressed current systems. We still have quite a number of impressed current systems in the south. Uh, most of which looks similar to this, right? What's wrong with this picture? Anybody understand what's going on with impressed current systems? What's that right there? Where is the power meter? The place is closed. They didn't pay their power bill. Power company comes along, yanks the meter out, no power. Quote, temporarily closed. Right? Well, guess what? Now you've got to permanently close. 